Alright, first off, I want to apologize for not uploading since my last video. I know it's been a month, but I had to figure out how I wanted to do this video. But besides that, I just want to thank you guys for watching my last video. I really appreciate it, and I hope you'll enjoy this video too. So, with no further ado, let's get into it. So, Dead Space was originally released back in 2008 on the PS3, Xbox 360, and Microsoft Windows. It was a critically acclaimed hit, and was soon after spoken about as one of the best horror games of all time. On the 27th of January, a remake of the original Dead Space was released to yet another round of appraisal from everyone. And once again, it was able to scare people thanks to the updated graphics and small changes to game design. Now, I haven't played the original Dead Space since it was originally released back in 08. This will kind of hold up the game review, seeing as I'll probably be missing out on a few new features or added story content. I'll start off this video by covering my road to Platinum. The Dead Space remake has 48 trophies, which consists of 35 bronze, 10 silver, 2 gold and of course, 1 platinum trophy. A lot of the trophies consist of completing the chapters in the game and getting kills with the different weapons. Others are combat specific trophies or difficulty related. Now, we start off the game by playing as Isaac Clarke while he and his crew aboard the Killian are getting ready to land on the USG Ishimura. They're going aboard the Ishimura to investigate a distress beacon which was sent out. While attempting to dock the Ishimura, something goes wrong and they end up kind of crash landing the ship. Soon after, Isaac, Hammond, Daniels and Chen go further into the ship to explore what's going on. We soon find out what triggered the distress beacon as Chen is greeted rather aggressively by a necromorph. We manage to escape by the skin of her teeth. And here we get the first weapon of the game, the Plasma Cutter. The way I planned my Platinum journey was to first complete the game on medium difficulty while only using the Plasma Cutter, getting all collectibles and completing all side quests. After this, I had to do a New Game Plus playthrough to get the remaining trophies related to the other weapons while also fully upgrading everything. I made a mistake though, which I'll get to later in the video. After getting the Plasma Cutter and speaking with Daniels slash Hammond, we need to go repair the tram, which will help us get to the different sections of the Ishimura. On our way to repairing the tram, we get our very first trophy of the game called Marksman, for dismembering 50 limbs. Once repaired, we call the tram for Daniels and Hammond so they can reach the bridge. We then make our way back to the Killian to help repair the Singularity Core, only to find out that there's necromorphs eating it, which results in the ship exploding. We're then required to move towards the medical wing of the Ishimura to get the captain's rig, which will give us level 1 clearance. After getting to the medical wing, we get our second trophy for completing chapter 1. All of chapter 2 is focused around exploring the medical wing with the ultimate goal of finding the captain's rig. On our way through medical, we are also introduced to the zero-g mechanic of the game, seeing as how we are required to go outside the Ishimura to reach another section of medical. Once we get to the security station, we notice that there is a blockade which covers the door to the captain's rig. So we now have to explore the two other sections to get the items required to create a minor explosion. After getting the items, we make our way back to the security station and blow up the blockade. This gives us access to the section wherein the captain is. It's also in this section where we find the first part of Nicole's side quest, a hologram showing her working on a patient. After following her hologram, we discover a secret room containing an audio log in which she explains her discovery of the mutations. While picking up the captain's rig, we're introduced to a new enemy type which, without consent, puts his limb inside a dead person and brings him back to life in the form of a necromorph. After clearing out the room, Hammond helps us reach security clearance level 1 so we can make our way to the bridge. After this, we complete chapter 2 and get yet another trophy. We start off chapter 3 in Zero G with the objective of getting to the engineering wing. On our way, we pick up a rig of a previous inhabitant of the Ishimura. This is needed for another side quest. In the engineering room, we were required to use the control panel to restart the engines of the Ishimura. Although, as usual, nothing goes according to plan. So, we need to fix the centrifuge and get the fuel running, followed by doing a full restart of everything. While completing these tasks, we find the second hologram of Nicole, in which she's doing an autopsy on a necromorph to discover more about the mutations. After using a gondola, we impale an enemy by using the limb from another, which earns us a trophy for pinning an enemy. After refueling the engines and fixing the centrifuge, we restart the engines and now need to make our way to the bridge to meet up with Hammond. After entering the tram station, we get the trophy for completing chapter 3. After making our way to the captain's nest, we meet up with Hammond, who's captured the mutated Chen in an escape capsule. After talking for a bit, he agrees to send off Chen into space. We move into the captain's nest and have a deep heart-to-heart -heart with Hammond. He informs us about the ADS cannons and how we need to get them back up and running. 
While in the captain's nest, we need to access a panel, which gives us the side quest of collecting different rigs from the inhabitants of Ishimura. We then make our way back into the main atrium, where we're greeted by a fat mutated boy. What the hell? Unfortunately, he's so big that we can't just shoot him like any other regular enemy. We need to get behind him and shoot him in his limbs. After defeating him, we get a trophy for taking down our very first brute enemy. Now we need to run around to different sections of the bridge to reroute power to the ADS cannons. After doing this, we need to manually make our way outside the Ishimura to recalibrate the ADS cannons. We do this by interacting with each of them and shooting down 5 meteors, which will reset their auto-aim. While making our way back to the captain's nest, we get the trophy for completing chapter 4. Daniels also contacts us and shows us a broadcast from Nicole, in which she tells us that the medical wing is a sanctuary, so of course we need to make our way there. Nicole is by the way Isaac's girlfriend who he hasn't spoken to in a while. When entering the security station in medical, all the doors get locked and someone speaks to us through the speakers telling us to sit by and wait until he's ready to see us. But we don't have time for that, so we ask Daniels to open the door for us and so we make our way to the place where Nicole is broadcasting. Once entering the room, we realize it was a pre-recorded broadcast, but before we can do anything about it, we're hit by a stasis attack. It's revealed that a doctor named Chalos Mercer was the one to put us in stasis. He begins a typical villain dialogue and tells us about his connection to the marker and convergence, whatever that is. After he releases us from stasis, we're ambushed by a new enemy called the Hunter. This guy has the ability to regenerate his limbs, which is a gigantic counter to how Isaac usually deals with necromorphs. After escaping the Hunter, we need to lift the lockdown that Mercer has put out. On our way to do this, we pick up our 75th log of the game, which earns us the trophy Storyteller. While in the room to lift the lockdown, we find a guy suffering on a table close by. He tells us to go fetch some liquid nitrogen to make an enzyme, something that could help put a stop to the poison gas. After removing the lockdown, Mercy uses other measures to stop us. He suddenly pumps in a deadly gas from the hydroponics wing, so now we need to make our way back to the security station to turn it off. We finally make our way towards cryogenics to find the liquid nitrogen, but after picking it up, we're once again greeted by the hunter. So we trap him inside a cryo chamber and start a process of cryo freezing. After doing this, we earn the trophy for completing chapter 5. We now need to make our way to the hydroponics to figure out how to create the enzyme. But before we go there, we need to complete some of the objectives for the side quests. This includes picking up a tissue sample from the hunter and analyzing it. Once we're done, we can finally move on. After entering hydroponics, we insert the liquid nitrogen into a machine to create the enzyme. We then enter the food storage section, seeing as how that's where the previous inhabitants tried to kill something. But when we enter, we get a call from a scientist called Elizabeth Cross, who tells us about a thing called the Leviathan. She tells us that the enzyme was designed to kill it, but Isaac doesn't need to inject the enzyme directly into it. Instead, we can weaken the Leviathan by simply injecting the enzyme into eight different Weezers, who are previous co-workers of Elizabeth who was infected. While completing this task, we also find our final weapon for the trophy, Fall Arsenal. Just after getting this trophy, we also get a trophy for using stasis on 50 enemies. After defeating a couple more enemies, we finally get the trophy Surgeon for dismembering 500 limbs. After running around the different parts of hydroponics and injecting the Weezers, we finally get to fight the Leviathan. Leviathan has three different stages to its fight but completing it on normal difficulty with our fully upgraded plasma cutter wasn't the biggest challenge. After flushing the Leviathan into space, we get a trophy for doing so. We then learn of an SOS beacon in the mining wing, which might just help us escape the hell that is Ishimura. Finishing the conversation with Daniels earns us a trophy for completing chapter 6. After making our way to the mining wing, we soon discover that the SOS beacon is missing and we can't open the launch tube seeing as how we need a higher security clearance. Therefore, we need to both find the SOS beacon and also find the admin rig. After finding the rig, we also find a very disturbing audio log left behind by Supervisor Dallas. In this audio log, we hear Dallas realizing what he has to do to avoid turning into a necromorph, cutting off his own limbs in the process. On our way to retrieve the SOS beacon, we are greeted by Nicole who somehow is still alive. She helps us progress through a locked door behind which we find the SOS beacon. As we once again try to launch the SOS beacon, we learn that the launch tubes are blocked by something. This means that we need to manually go into the mining bay to destroy the gravity tethers, which are holding the asteroid in place. After doing so, we manage to attach the SOS beacon and send it out into space. 
Daniels then calls us to inform us that the comms array is misaligned, which we of course need to fix. As we make our way into the tram station, we get the trophy for completing chapter 7. Before making our way back to the bridge, we now need to open several doors scattered across the different wings to get some collectibles and upgrade nodes. After arriving at the comms access hall, we need to correct the dish alignment to reactivate the comms array. To do this, we need to complete a rather annoying puzzle, which can be pretty disorienting since we need to turn upside down, left and right. After finally completing this, we receive a broadcast from the USM Valor, which has picked up the distress call from our SOS beacon. Daniels tries to answer them only to realize that something is blocking the blast doors over the comms array. We make our way to investigate what's going on, only to find out that the leviathan that we flushed earlier has taken a liking to the blast doors. With the help of cannons and our handy plasma cutter, we finally manage to kill the leviathan once and for all, earning us a trophy in the process. But once we go to restart the comms array, we discover that USM Valor has picked up the escape capsule, which contained the mutated Chen. And so, Chen has single-handedly taken out the entirety of Valor, which results in it crashing into the Ishimura. Isaac then gets the honor of going onto the Valor to take the Singularity Core to use in an executive escape vessel. After entering the airlock on USM Valor, we earn the trophy for completing Chapter 8. Soon after entering, we learn that Valor is carrying a 12 megaton warhead which we need to disarm. On our way to do so, we're greeted by mutated necromorphs. These necromorphs are incredibly fast thanks to the soldiers having stasis packs equipped on their armor while they were turned. After successfully disarming the warhead, we can finally move on with our objective of retrieving the Singularity Core. On our way, we discover a shooting gallery, which malfunctions and results in us getting overrun by necromorphs. After deposing of them, we earn the trophy Front Toward Enemy for surviving the onslaught. Soon after, we find our final weapon schematic for the trophy Merchant. After going up an elevator with the Singularity Core in sight, suddenly a blast door comes down separating us from the Singularity Core and Hammond. It turns out that Chen was inside the room. Chen ends up taking out Hammond, but not before Hammond can push them both into the electricity field surrounding the Singularity Core. With the threat gone, the blast door is open and we can finally pick up the Singularity Core. After doing so, the Valor begins to explode and so we need to escape before we blow up with it. We succeed and end up back in the comms access hall. This earns us the trophy for completing Chapter 9. Chapter 10 now requires us to reach the Executive Shuttle and insert the Singularity Core. On our way there, we stop by the Captain's Nest to deliver all the different rigs we've been collecting. This earns us the Master Clearance and along with it a trophy for doing so. So now we can finally get all the final weapon upgrades slash upgrade notes. While collecting everything, we also find the final audio log, which completes the side quest telling us about the Hunter's origins. This earns us the trophy, Final Regeneration. After collecting everything, we can finally continue the story. We make our way to the crew deck and play a bit of Zero G Ball. This earns us another trophy called Sea Baller. As we enter the central nexus, we discover two men arguing about something. We find out that it's Jacob Temple, Elizabeth Cross's boyfriend, arguing with Dr. Mercer about the marker. Jacob is able to fire a shot at Mercer, followed by Mercer putting him in stasis. Isaac and Mercer then talk about convergence and the meaning behind it, all ending with Mercer killing Jacob. We're then attacked by the hunter once again. The central nexus is infested with big groups of mutation, so our objective now is to clear it out, so we can reach the executive shuttle. This takes us to a lot of different parts of the crew deck. While doing this, we discover the final hologram of Nicole's investigation, and earns us the trophy for completing her side quest called Hole Again. While exploring some more, we find the last lock needed for the trophy, Legend Teller. On our way to clear the last mutation, we meet Dr. Kain, who is also trying to escape the Ishimura. He informs us of an ancient being living inside AG7, the planet below the Ishimura. He tells us that Mercer calls it the Hive Mind, and that it's able to control the necromorphs using telepathy. He then goes on to say that if we return the marker to Aegis, it should put the Hive Mind back into a slumber. Dr. Kain and Isaac agrees to load the marker aboard the executive shuttle and bring it back down to Aegis. After removing the final mutation and making our way back to the central nexus, we begin the process of moving the marker into the shuttle bay, ready for loading. We progress further and install the singularity core onto the executive shuttle, although we need to perform an engine test. While doing so, who should show up but everybody's favorite hunter? After luring the hunter behind the shuttle's engines, we once again test fire them to finally be rid of the creature. He gets blasted by what can only be described as the hellfire after eating a load of Taco Bell. 
We then get grabbed by a giant tentacle and watch Mercer complain yet again about the convergence. But he gets betrayed and is also picked up by a giant tentacle. After we escape our personal experience with tentacle po- we got the trophy for completing chapter 10. Unfortunately, I forgot to record this section, but while moving the marker into the hangar bay, there's a hidden treasure called Ping. After picking up this treasure, another trophy popped called There's Always Ping. In chapter 11, we're tasked with loading the marker onto the executive shuttle. After doing so, we make our way back to into the shuttle ourselves. But while going down the runway, Dr. Kain is suddenly shot by someone. That someone being Daniels. Soon after, we get a call from her, in which she explains how she couldn't trust him with the marker. We then learn that Daniels is actually working for a department called EarthGov, and that she joined this expedition to clean up a huge mess. She then reveals that the marker isn't in fact an alien artifact, but is instead something that was built by humans. The original marker was alien and inspired unitology. But the marker aboard the executive shuttle is just a copy and was used as an experiment aboard the Ishimura. Daniels was only hired to sweep everything under the rock. She leaves Isaac behind aboard the Ishimura to find his own way off the ship. After this, we get a call from Nicole who tells us to meet her in flight control, seeing as there's still a way off the Ishimura. After meeting up with Nicole, she shows us a panel which is capable of recalling the shuttle back to the Ishimura. After pressing the button, we get a notification that an escape pod has been shot out of the executive shuttle, which of course was thanks to Daniels. We then enter the executive shuttle together with Nicole and make our way down to Aegis 7 to return the marker. After landing the shuttle, we get the trophy for completing chapter 11. The entirety of chapter 12 is about moving the marker through Aegis 7 to finally load it onto the right platform. After loading the marker, we need to reroute the tether controls. After doing so, we get locked inside the control room and Daniel shows us the truth. All this time, the Nicole we've been running around with has actually just been Elizabeth Cross the scientist from hydroponics. This is the result of the marker interfering with Isaac's mind, making him see what he wants. The same has happened to Elizabeth, who saw Isaac as her boyfriend Jacob Temple. We then get to see the full recording of Nicole that was shown in the beginning of the game. After doing her monologue, Nicole is seen pushing a needle into her arm, killing her instantly. After watching the recording, Aegis 7 is suddenly hit by some seismic attacks caused by the hive mind. We make our way back towards the executive shuttle only to see giant tentacles and falling pieces of rocks which are caused by the falling asteroid from Ishimura which we released earlier in the game. Daniels tries to make her way to the shuttle but is quickly stopped by a tentacle which results in her death. And finally we hear the final boss of Dead Space which was all too easy. After learning the movesets you can easily beat this boss without getting hit even once. But alas, we beat the hype mind and earn a trophy for doing so. We then escape with the help of the executive shuttle. Flying into space, we watch the asteroid hit the surface of Aegis, destroying the planet. And in the meantime, we earn three trophies. Exodus, for completing chapter 12. One gun, for completing the game using only the plasma cutter. And finally, set a benchmark for completing the game on medium or above. We then get to experience the infamous jump scare ending, and then credits roll. It was now time for me to complete the game on New Game Plus to earn the alternate ending, completing the game on Impossible, and upgrading everything. Only, there was a small problem. See, I had thought that I would be able to complete New Game Plus on the Impossible difficulty, but that wasn't the case. Apparently, you can only play New Game Plus on Impossible if you complete a new game on Impossible. This meant that I would have to play through the game three times. But I powered through and did it anyway. I chose to first start off with the New Game Plus part. While playing through, I had to be aware of a new collectible called Marco Fragments, which is required to get the alternate ending. I also had to recollect all the upgrade nodes so I could fully upgrade everything. And finally, I had to get the trophies connected to each gun, plus some miscellaneous combat trophies I was missing. In order, I earned the following trophies on my New Game Plus playthrough. Marked for finding our first Marco Fragment, Pack Rat, for placing 25 items into storage, and 6 different trophies for killing 30 enemies with each weapon. The Pulse Rifle, the Ripper, the Flamethrower, the Force Gun, the Line Gun, and the Contact Beam. I then got Build to Order for installing every weapon upgrade, Backbreaker for killing 10 enemies by stomping on them, 
maxed out for fully upgrading everything. And finally, I got Reunion for watching the alternate ending, plus Trusted Contractor for completing the game on New Game Plus. Unfortunately, I also forgot to record these trophies. Now, the only thing I was missing was to complete the game on impossible difficulty. This would prove to be the most annoying task of all. Unbeknownst to me, impossible truly means impossible. On this difficulty, the enemies have the same damage as they do on hard difficulty, although they still had normal health. But don't let this fool you, because there's another added challenge to all of this. If you end up dying, you will have to restart all the way from the beginning. This means that you will need to complete the game without dying a single time. That is, if there wasn't a way to kind of restart from the last checkpoint. You see, I could have surely completed the game without using this method, I'm sure. But if you back out to the main menu just as you die, you can actually load back your recently saved game without it being downgraded to a hard save file. But truth be told, I only had to use this method about 4 to 6 times. As soon as I got a bit into the game and was able to upgrade my weapons a bit, it was all a process of keeping a distance from enemies while also abusing stasis, seeing as how it's one of the most powerful methods to keep enemies from attacking you. While playing through Impossible, I also had to rip off a dangling limb from an enemy, seeing as how I hadn't been able to do it in previous playthroughs. Unfortunately, once again I forgot to record, because I thought I wasn't missing any trophies. I promise this won't be happening again in future videos. But after fighting my way through impossible difficulty, I finally had the Platinum Trophy. Overall, it took me 4 days and 5 hours to achieve, with an in-game time of about 20 hours I think. In my game review, I'll glance over the different aspects, which helped to create the horrific experience that is this remake. First off, the graphics. This game has gotten a giant overhaul in the graphics department. I'd like to say it's almost on par with the Demon's Souls remake, which was released with the PS5. The remake has really helped to make the experience be just as horrific in 2023 as it was back in 2008. The updated design of the Necromorphs plays a big role in the scare factor. The design is all about creeping you out. The Necromorphs have long, thin and spiky limbs, sometimes with their insides hanging out their stomachs. The game also often has dark sections, in which you will get ambushed by a Necromorph from behind. In my previous video, which you can watch by clicking the annotation in the top right corner, I talked about the amazing graphics the Callisto Protocol has. But Dead Space also has some insanely realistic graphics slash facial animations. And of course it makes sense to compare the two games, seeing as they have the same foundations. Next up is the gameplay. EA's Motive has upgraded the gameplay of the old game to feel like a true 2023 release. They've also made the game feel a bit more linear, but at the same time opened the game up for a lot of exploration. Again, comparing the Callisto Protocol and Dead Space, this remake actually feels like you're all alone aboard an abandoned spaceship, with loads of exploration to be done, which also rewards you for doing so. In Dead Space, the combat encounters felt a lot more surprising and scary compared to the Callisto Protocol. Running around looking for ammunition when you suddenly get jumped by an enemy helps you feel more immersed in the game as a whole. Another change they've made is how you gain access to new weapons. In the original Dead Space, you had to buy the new weapons from the shop. However, in the remake, they've made it so that you get the weapons as you progress through the story. They've also changed some of the sections in the game. One example is when you had to re-enable the ADS cannons aboard the Ishimura. In the original game, you had to run on the ground, hiding behind different obstacles to avoid the incoming meteors. But in the remake, they've made it so that you need to control each of the cannons and manually shoot down the meteors. And at last, the story. There isn't really much to talk about here. The story in the remake is basically the same as the original. Motive has added some additional side quests and objectives, which add some deeper layers to the original story. The game also features an alternate ending in which we see Isaac finally losing his mind and giving in to the insanity of the marker. If you've never played Dead Space, or if you already have but want to experience it again, I can faithfully and trustfully recommend the remake. This is one of the few games which really deserve the remake treatment, and EA's Motive has done an amazing job doing so. I truly hope to see them remake Dead Space 2 as well. If they choose to do so, I hope they also remake Dead Space 3, but change up the gameplay slash story to fit in more with the previous two games. And finally, 
I just want to say thanks to everyone who watched my previous video. It's always scary to work so hard at something if it doesn't get any recognition or positive feedback. So please, do me a favor and like and subscribe if you like to see content focusing on platinum trophies and game reviews. I can tell you guys that I'm working on two other videos at the moment. One of the videos is focusing on a game called Rollerdrome, and the other is focusing on Hogwarts Legacy. So stay tuned if you want to watch more.